All right, well, I'm gonna, let's get into the presentations, the reason you came here, not to hear me talk, but I, I do want to mention one thing. Um, George Hicks and I have to get together periodically. He's going to be our first speaker. He's going to talk about the Clean Water Fund. And uh, in my position, I have to work with George in, in funding several Clean Water Fund projects through the state of Connecticut. And uh, I was bantering with George about the uh, projects that we had upcoming. One was II projects, and I was questioning a change in the way that the priority list was addressing infiltration inflow and the level of participation. It used to be an 80%, or for a while there was 80% uh, uh, loan and 20% grant. It's changing to 100% loan. It's a 2% loan. So even that, George said, well, you know what? Only three people applied last year. Three municipalities applied for 80% low interest loan at 2% and 20% grant to have your sewers lined based on infiltration inflow, but we all know that's renewal too. So I had my accountant, this, I'd have to go back to my engineering uh, manuals to do this myself, but I had my accountant put this together and it's kind of interesting. It's, it shows basically the interest on a $5 million project over 20 years. So if you did a $5 million clean water fund project versus a $5 million project where the municipality would borrow, and um, you can see the different uh, rates that were used, it's very conservative, 4.25 um, uh, bond rate for the municipality and 2% for the loan. The difference over the course of the loan is $1.4 million kind of aggravates me that my hometown never applied for this money, you know, because that's $1.4 million if you equated it to lining pipes, just if you did that, a 12-inch pipe costs about $75 a foot to line. That's 18,000 feet. It's more than three miles of sewer you could have lined in your town for the cost of, of what the, uh, the interest rate that accrued. So I thought that was interesting, food for thought. So listen to George and listen to how you can get money out of, uh, or work with, with the DEP to get clean water fund money because it's a shame. I don't think as many people use it as, as should. Um, and that's all I have to say. So with that, I'm going to introduce George Hicks from the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. He's a supervising engineer, sanitary engineer for the Municipal Water uh, Pollution Control Section. Uh, George has worked with DEP for 23 years in the uh, Municipal Pl Water Pollution Control Section. He supervises staff and engineers for planning, design, construction, and financing of upgrades to municipal sewer treatment plants and wastewater collection systems. He, he develops the State Clean Water Fund Priority List and has served as the hearing officer for the Priority List since 2008. He does a great job at that. That's not an easy thing to do if you've ever been to one of those hearings. Uh, George has a Bachelor's of Science in Engineering from UConn and is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. So please welcome George Hicks. There he is. Good morning. Thank you, Tom. Um, <clears throat> since we're about to issue the uh, Clean Water Fund priority list uh, for 2016 and 17, it's probably a couple of weeks away from issuance. Um, I want to go through kind of on a high level what we go through to develop it, and then what role you all can play in the process. Now, the priority list, the funding rules, and what it funds changes over time. These changes are to the administrative requirements to the program, occasionally to the point system, the types of projects that we fund, and to the grants that are applied to the projects. Some reasons for these changes, it could be to implement a new program. If you think back in time, the nitrogen general permit. It could be the passage of a public act. We've had several of them recently with uh, phosphorus funding. It could be new EPA requirements, uh, come to mind as green infrastructure requirements or fiscal sustainability plans. Or it could be to address something like the program's cash flow needs. Our program, and you'll see later on the presentation, has grown so much recently that we have a lot of money out in construction money, but there's no repayments back because it's currently structured where the repayments come once the project is built. 
but we have an obligation to pay bondholders twice a year. So we need to modify that, which we are starting to do with the big utilities. We take a construction loan and we close it every year, move them into repayments, we continue to fund the project. So those are some of the things that, you know, the challenges we face and it's always changing and it's, we're always trying to get out and to, you know, let everyone know what these changes are and why we do them. Now we developed this priority list, you know, there's a lot of players that are involved. It just isn't our work alone. For instance, for us, we work with, you know, three state agencies, the Office of Policy and Management, the Office of Fiscal Analysis, and the straight, State Treasurer's Office. We have to work with the EPA on the federal side, and then we work with all of you with the local WPCAs and development of the list. Um, we then move forward, but then, uh, you know, the state legislature plays a large role, and quite often what we start with and what our plan is isn't approved at the state legislative level. So, you know, they develop the, uh, the state capital budget, it identifies funds for our program, and then that's what we have to work with. So in the final analysis, it really is a compromise on many levels. Okay, so in essence, this, I think you guys can see, you should be able to read this from your seats. Uh, these are the type of projects that we fund for construction. And if you look at the top four, that happens to be our current work priorities. As Tom mentioned, um, you know, the funding has grown tremendously, but the staff uh, really, you know, we've lost a lot of staff. So this is where our highest priorities are. The top two actually represent where the majority of the money happens to be going. Uh, currently, the drivers for a lot of this is the nitrogen general permit. It's the uh, new NIPTES permits for phosphorus limits, and it's CSO control uh, for uh, communities that are under enforcement actions. This list does change over time because state priorities do change. Municipal needs change, there are new federal requirements, and the available funding. These are the program funding um, grant percentages. They all have an accompanying loan with the exception of planning, it's just a planning grant, no loan. Uh, the collection system is variable at the bottom. It's either it has been, very recently it's been 20%, typically it's been loan only and that's up to our discretion and that's generally a matter of how much available grant funds we have to spread out to the communities. Source of funds, EPA and then two types of state funds. The EPA funding is pretty minor at this point. Currently it's about 5% of our program funds. Years ago it was a significant portion. So it's really you're funded on state bond funds. General obligation covers the grant piece, the revenue bonds cover the loan. Uh, general obligation bonds, that also goes against state bonding cap. So you may read about this in the paper and see some of the challenges of not exceeding it. So when uh, we're pushed up against that limit, then it affects Clean Water Fund program. That also has to do with um, recognizing the state bonding cap is, is a calendar year cap that affects when we can go to the bond commission to get more money for your projects. So typically we're not going at the end of the year because they're up against the cap. So how do you get funded? Uh, <clears throat> there's basically three areas to do it. You know, as a category project, one, two, three, uh, through the priority point system for a construction project or as a reserve. Now category projects, You've got one, two, and three. Category one, that's where you're on the previous priority list. We're moving into a new priority list. You've done everything you need to do. You've bid your project, submitted a complete application, and we're just going through the process of trying to close the agreement. So, uh, and you might be a project that didn't have enough priority points to be funded, but you're at the top of the list. So you get the first slice of the money. So if you're listed as category one, you get it before everybody else. Category two, I've never, since I've been a hearing officer, I've never had a category two, I've never seen a category three. The category two is gonna be something more like uh, we have an upcoming project, you'll hear more about it a little bit later uh, with Brian McCarthy, NDC South Hartford Conveyance Storage Tunnel. That's a five contract project, you know, we're funding the first contract, the utility relocation. Uh, they're about to start the, uh, the tunnel itself, that's contract two. If we only fund those two, and don't fund anything else. I mean, the project's kind of worthless. You've, you've dumped $300 million into a very deep hole in the ground, and Brian can talk about that. 
So the other, the other three contracts, which are much smaller in nature and size and, and, and dollar amount, they'd be category two projects. To make the, the entire project functional, we have to fund the others. So they, they would be a category two. Excuse me. Next is priority points for construction projects. <clears throat> now I've organized this not in the order you'd find them in the, uh, you know, the priority list or in the regulations, but based upon how you get the largest number of points. So this kind of shows you based on our priority point system, uh, you know, really how you get on, on the, uh, the fundable construction list, the table in the middle of the uh, priority list. Meet water quality standards, that's for CSO and phosphorus projects, or if you're, uh, you know, working toward uh, the goal for nitrogen removal, if you don't already meet your current final limit and the population served. So basically the point system is really set up and it's always been set up uh, to, to drive the money into these areas which result in the largest water quality benefits. You have lesser number of points, you know, for these other areas. So, you know, your project might enhance fishery, shellfishing, swimming or treatment plant operations or it might eliminate you know, failing septic systems, um, sewage backups into homes, and, and uh, eutrophication on water courses. Now for the reserve, this is the third component. So you have the category one, two, three, which sometimes I'm not even sure we'll have anything on this priority list. Um, fundable construction projects, predominantly CSO and nutrient uh, removal and then the reserves. These are first come, first serve, by and large. Funding's not based upon priority points at all. Uh, few, with a few exceptions, like the small community ones, it's open to anybody, though we actually designate the communities that receive that. And it changes over time based upon a number of other factors I won't get into here. Uh, these are example on the current priority list, you know, things we're gonna fund. You know, we'll fund cost increases for existing construction projects. You know, we continue to fund the planning grants we wanna keep that pipeline moving where people are planning their future, looking at overall wastewater management needs for their community or whether it's an upgrade to the plant. We'll still fund design work if we believe it's a fundable construction project in three years. We have to do a small community project. Um, sometimes we do several in the course of the priority list. And we have collection system uh, improvements, you know, pipes and pumps, upgrades, and then green infrastructure. Okay, before the priority list, this is probably the most important slide to a lot of the WPCAs out there. Um, we start looking at the statewide needs, and these needs we have to look at way in advance of the priority list. In fact, it was, we started looking at this about a year and a half ago before we did this priority list. So, you know, we look at the past call for projects, our engineers are familiar with the status of how things are moving on their projects, you know, cost and schedule, and then we seek updates for the big utilities uh, to get a sense of, you know, what, what are the needs collectively statewide for all your projects. Then we prepare our own deep um, two-year capital budget. Now, our, our capital budget has, last time, had 19 line items on it. Clean water fund is only one. So we're competing with ourselves for the funding to some degree. And in the last capital budget, it represented 83% of our, or our capital budget was a clean water fund program. We're fortunate that our commissioner really believes strongly in the benefits of the clean water fund program, so we never get scaled back. So I just push the needs forward, and he honors that and, and pushes that as hard as he can uh, you know, forward. So. We develop that, it goes off to the Office of Policy and Management, and they're the ones that actually develop the two-year capital budget. There's quite a bit of negotiation back and forth between us and OPM, cash flow needs of the state, cash flow needs of the program, being able to cover all of your projects. And eventually they release the official capital budget to the state. And this is really where, you know, your role is key to our success. And, and you guys have actually done a great job because when I show you a slide later on as to how we've done so well, I mean, it's certainly a testament to all the hard work done by the people in the room, this organization as well as other organizations. 
It's during that time when you can go out there and you can reach out to your legislators and explain to them the importance of the program and the funding for your community and what you need to do. Um, you know, we also work with other groups that, that, you know, support the program too. So you've got the local WPCAs and the work you do. You've got the organization here today with the Connecticut Association of WPCAs. You've got the um, Connecticut Water Pollution Abatement Association, the Clean Water and Investment Coalition, various environmental groups like Connecticut Fund for the Environment and Save the Sound. They participate in this. And then a lot of professional organizations like New England Water Environment Association, Connecticut Construction Industry Association, the Utility Contractor Association of Connecticut. They all work together to really push hard to support this program because in the end, we can't do it. We can only say, this is what the needs are. And if they want to scale back the needs, we can only speak to, this is the implication statewide to pulling back the funding. So that work really has to be done you know, by, by you guys here. So now we're going to talk just about the priority list process. So last spring, we went ahead and did a call for projects. You submit what your needs are. We look at, you know, your readiness to proceed. We got to see what the available funds are in the recently approved capital budget. And then we developed the draft, which, you know, went out for public comment not that long ago. We had the hearing uh, toward the end, April 19th. And then I'm in the process of preparing the, uh, the hearing examiner's report. And when that's done and signed off, that becomes a new priority list. Now, this shows really the, the benefits of the work that you guys have been doing. IFO is an interim funding obligation. Think of it as, you know, you're going to build a, a project. It's your construction agreement. <clears throat> and then in the end, you'd have a permanent loan obligation. But that's your construction agreement. So I looked at it from fiscal year 2000 through 2016. These are millions of dollars. And you can see, you know, years ago, it, the, the, the amount of money was a lot less. In fact, from 2000 to 2007, the average was $67 million a year. And from 2008 to 2000, through 2016, what we project will be at this year, it went from 67 to 246 million per year. And this year alone, we're on track to do over $700 million in new project work. So that shows, you know, really the, you know, the hard work of, of everybody in the room supporting the project because, you know, this certainly wouldn't even be possible to be managing having this type of funding for wastewater projects. But despite this, it's still never enough because, you know, when I go through the prior list process, I still get comments about how come you can't fund us. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of money, but it's still not going to meet all statewide needs. This, you know, this certainly is the biggest we've ever had by far this year. And we see looking forward, uh, you know, the trend is still going to be pretty high just to deal with the CSO and the phosphorus. So on this priority list, just kind of organize, you know, you know, CSO control and nitrogen, phosphorus, and then the reserves and some of the projects. And that's basically was reflected in the priority list. But when I looked at it and I broke it down, occasionally I do this just to get a sense of, you know, well, where is all the money going? And it kind of shifts around a little bit between, you know, CSO control and nutrient removal. I was kind of surprised to see that, you know, the CSO control, around 40% of the program funding is going there and nutrient removal which is nutrient removal plus the associated upgrades at the plant, was a little over 40%. And then what we have in collection system, whether it's, you know, small community type work with sewer extensions or, you know, I and I work or pump station upgrades with 17. So it kind of hit the normal balance. The only thing is you add it up and it's, it's a billion dollars this time. So that's, you know, unprecedented. So, you know, in summary, you know, just on our program, you know, it, it results in water quality improvements, you know, mostly it's CSO and nutrient removal, it supports economic development. You need to have, you know, good utilities in your municipality to be able to attract business. Creates or retains jobs, and these are good paying jobs for, you know, in the engineering field, construction, manufacturing. 
the figure of 21 jobs per million dollars, that's OPM's estimate, but you know, you, there are other organizations that actually show the numbers significantly higher as far as the new jobs that are created or retained through a program like this. Uh, our program is fairly low cost, where 70% of the funds get repaid back to the state with interest, and it keeps the rates low for the sewer users and taxpayers. I think everyone should be commended for the great job that they've done, you know, managing your utilities, uh, protecting the environment, and actually as things go on with further upgrades to the plant, improving the environment. So just uh, keep up the great work that you all, you've all been doing, and you know, we'll look forward to continue to work with you as projects go forward. Thank you.